what our group, One Day Sooner, is doing is advocating on behalf of the challenged uh, volunteers, people interested in doing these trials. And our goal is to make sure that these trials are uh, prepared and ready to and available for use uh, as soon as possible in case they're, they're going to be useful. Do people get paid for doing it? So basically, we think the question of compensation and pay, that's something to be figured out for the future. Uh, and it's kind of a secondary question. You know, pretty clearly, um, you know, there's going to be uh, reimbursement for expenses, lost wages, travel expenses, things like that. And, you know, insurance for if, you know, something bad does happen or for any long-term harms um, and kind of long-term follow-up care, things like that, those are obviously going to be um, part of any arrangement for, for challenge trial volunteers. But beyond that, um, we think the important question is, should these challenge trials go forward at all? And then, as long as volunteers are treated fairly, that's when we can answer the question about compensation. So, so Josh, what do you think motivates these, these volunteers? Well, I think it changes uh, from a number of different people and a number of different reasons. But I think that a lot of people, a lot of our volunteers, talk about the desire to feel empowered and to feel like they're doing an active role in, in fighting this disease and fighting the virus, rather than instead being kind of passive and, and demoralized. I think people also you know, really have, have family members that they want to protect, that they often mention, older relatives or sometimes people's kids. And people also mention that it's something that they can do, that they're young and healthy and able to do this. And so it's a way that they want to be helping. Josh, are you are you signing up children? And, and ultimately, don't you have to recruit children to do it because they are carriers and, and they transmit, and so therefore they would likely uh, be candidates to get the vaccine once we have one? Yeah, so the, um, so the answer to that is no. Uh, we wouldn't anticipate people younger than 18 uh, being part of a challenge trial. And challenge trials usually involve young, healthy people. In this case, it might be something like 18 to 30 or 18 to 40, um, and you healthy people to, to keep the risks as low as possible. Um, the reason you wouldn't test uh, children, obviously one issue is, is people's ability to consent, um, but also you know, it's very common in, in even conventional vaccine studies that for that kind of traditional, quote, phase three of efficacy study, you wouldn't necessarily uh, include children in that or elderly people in that. Um, instead, you'd be figuring out, you know, is this gonna be effective for most of the population. And then you can have a license where physicians can still um, prescribe it to children. You might do a later study once you know it's safe and effective in adults on vulnerable populations like children or like the elderly. Well, what about different races, different ethnicities? Are, are you making sure you have different samples from different populations as there continue to be questions about who's vulnerable, whether our genetics make us susceptible to symptoms or not, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one thing I should mention is that we are not the ones who'd be running this study ourselves. Instead, it'd be run by somewhere like a university or the National Institute of Health. Um, and they ultimately would decide the eligibility criteria and the goals in, in their recruitment process. That said, you know, we definitely want to have a very large and diverse pool of eligible volunteers, which we do have right now. We have more than 24,000 people signed up from more than 100 countries around the world. And so we do think that insofar as diversity is going to be important from a clinical perspective, that's also something that we think our, our volunteer population can, can supply.